please remember to leave a like, a comment, share the video about, and if you haven't already, subscribe. Thank you. Mmm, nice. The Gold Bug by Edgar Allan Poe Many years ago, I contracted an intimacy with a Mr. William Legrand. He was of an ancient Huguenot family and had once been wealthy, but a series of misfortunes had reduced him to want. To avoid the mortification consequent upon his disasters, he left New Orleans, the city of his forefathers, and took up his residence at Sullivan's Island near Charleston, South Carolina. This island is a very singular one. It consists of little else than the sea sand and is about three miles long. Its breadth at no point exceeds a quarter of a mile. It is separated from the mainland by a scarcely perceptible creek, oozing its way through a wilderness of reeds and slime, a favorite resort of the marsh hen. The vegetation, as might be supposed, is scant, or at least dwarfish. No trees of any magnitude are to be seen near the western extremity where Fort Moultrie stands, and where are some miserable frame buildings tenanted during summer by the fugitives from Charleston dust and fever may be found, indeed, the bristly palmetto. But the whole island with the exception of this western point and a line of hard white beach on the sea coast is covered with a dense undergrowth of the sweet myrtle, so much prized by the horticulturists of England the shrub here often attains the height of 15 or 20 feet and forms an almost impenetrable coppice, burthening the air with its fragrance. In the inmost recesses of this coppice, not far from the eastern or more remote end of the island, Legrand had built himself a small hut, which he occupied when I first, by mere accident, made his acquaintance. This soon ripened into friendship, for there was much in the recluse to excite interest and esteem. I found him well educated, with unusual powers of mind, but infected with misanthropy and subject to perverse moods of alternate enthusiasm and melancholy. He had with him many books, but rarely employed them. His chief amusements were gunning and fishing, or sauntering along the beach and through the myrtles, in quest of shells or entomological specimens. His collection of the latter might have been envied by a swamadam. In these excursions, he was usually accompanied by Jupiter, who had been manumitted before the reverses of the family, but who could be induced, neither by threat nor by promises, to abandon what he considered his right of attendance upon the footsteps of his young Massa Will. It is not improbable that the relatives of Legrand conceiving him to be somewhat unsettled in intellect, had contrived to instill this obstinacy into Jupiter, with a view to the supervision and guardianship of the Wanderer. The winters in the latitude of Sullivan's Island are seldom very severe, and in the fall of the year it is a rare event indeed when a fire is considered necessary. About the middle of October 18-something, there occupied, however, a day of remarkable chilliness. Just before the sunset, I scrambled my way through the evergreens to the hut of my friend, whom I had not visited for several weeks, my residence being at that time in Charleston, a distance of nine miles from that island, while the facilities of passage and repassage were very far behind those of the present day. Upon reaching the hut, I rapped, as was my custom, and getting no reply sought for the key where I knew it was secreted, unlocked the door and went in. A fine fire was blazing upon the hearth. It was a novelty and by no means an ungrateful one. I threw off an overcoat, took an armchair by the crackling locks, and awaited patiently the arrival of my hosts. Soon after the dark they arrived, and gave me a most cordial welcome. Jupiter, grinning from ear to ear, bustled about to prepare some marsh hens for supper. The grand was in one of his fits, how else shall I term them, of enthusiasm. He had found an unknown bivalve, forming a new genus, and more than this, he had hunted down and secured, with Jupiter's assistance, a scarabaeus, which he believed to be totally new, but in respect to which he wished to have my opinion on the morrow. And why not tonight? I asked, rubbing my hands over the blaze and wishing the whole tribe of scarabae at the devil. Ah, if only I had known you were here, said Legrand, but it's so long since I saw you, and how could I foresee that you would pay me visit this very night of all others? As I was coming home, I met Lieutenant G from the fort, and very foolishly I lent him the bug, so it will be impossible for you to see it until morning. Stay here tonight, and I will send Jupe down for it at sunrise. It is the loveliest thing in creation. What, sunrise? Nonsense, no. 
the bug. It is of a brilliant gold color, about the size of a large hickory nut, with two jet black spots near one extremity of the back, and another somewhat longer at the other. The antennae are, they ain't no tin in massa, Will. I keep a telling on you. Here interrupted Jupiter. The bug is a ghoul bug. Solid, every bit of him, inside nor set in wing. Never feel half so happy a bug in my life. Well, I suppose it is, Jupe, replied Legrand, somewhat more earnestly. It seemed to me that the case demanded, is that any reason for your letting the birds burn the colour? Where well, he turned to me, is it really almost enough to warrant Jupiter's idea? You never saw a more brilliant metallic lustre than the scales emit. But of this you cannot judge till tomorrow. In the meantime, I can give you some idea of the shape. Saying this, he seated himself at a small table, on which were a pen and ink, but no paper. He looked for some in the drawer, but found none. Never mind, he said at length. This will answer. And he drew from his waistcoat a pocket of scrap of what took to be very dirty full scrap, and made upon it a rough drawing with the pen. While he did this, I retained my seat by the fire, for I was still chilly. When the design was complete, he handed it to me without rising. As I received it, a loud growl was heard, succeeded by a scratching at the door. Jupiter opened it and a large Newfoundland belonging to the Grand rushed in, leaped upon my shoulders and loaded me with caresses, for I had shown him much attention during previous visits. When his gambols were over, I looked at the paper and, to speak the truth, found myself not a little puzzled at what my friend had depicted. Well, I said after contemplating it for some minutes, this is a strange scarabaeus, I must confess new to me. Never saw anything like it before, unless it was a skull or a death's head, which it more nearly resembles than anything else that has come under my observation. A death's head, echoed Legrand. Oh, yes, well, it has something of that. Appearance upon paper, no doubt. The two upper black spots look like eyes, eh? And the longer one at the bottom like a mouth. And then the shape of the hole is oval. Perhaps so, said I. But Legrand, I fear you are no artist. I must wait until I see the beetle itself, if I am to form any idea of its personal appearance. But I don't know, he said, a little nettled. I draw tolerably. Should do it at least have had good masters and flatter myself that I am not quite a blockhead. But my dear fellow, you are joking then, said I. This is a very passable skull indeed. I may say that is a very excellent skull, according to the vulgar notions about such specimens of physiology. And your scarabaeus must be the queerest scarabaeus in the world that resembles it. Why, we may get up a very thrilling bit of superstition upon this hint. I presume you will call the bug scarabaeus caput hominis, or something of that kind. There are many titles in the natural histories. But where are the antennae you spoke of? The antennae, said Legrand, who seemed to be getting unaccountably warm upon the subject. I'm sure you must see the antennae. I made them as distinct as they are in the original insect, and I presume that is sufficient. Well, well, said I. Perhaps you have. Still, I don't see him, and I handed him the paper without additional remark, not wishing to ruffle his temper, but I was very much surprised at the turn affairs had taken. His ill humor puzzled me, and as for the drawing of the beetle, there was positively no antennae visible and the whole did bear a very close resemblance to the ordinary cuts of a death's head. He received the paper very peevishly, and I was about to crumble it, apparently to throw it in the fire, when a casual glance at the design seemed to suddenly rivet his attention. In an instant, his face grew violently red, in another as excessively pale. For some minutes, he continued to scrutinize the drawing minutely where he sat. At length, he arose, took a candle from the table, and proceeded to seat himself upon a sea chest in the farthest corner of the room. Here again, he made an anxious examination of paper, turning it in all directions. He said nothing, however, and his conduct greatly astonished me, yet I thought it prudent not to exacerbate the growing moodiness of his temper by any comment. Presently, he took from his coat pocket a wallet, placed the paper carefully in, and deposited both in a writing desk which he locked. He now grew more composed in his demeanor, but his original air of enthusiasm had quite disappeared, yet he seemed not so much sulky as abstracted. As the evening wore away, he became more and more absorbed in reverie, from which no sallies of mine could arouse him. It had been my to pass the night at the hut, as I had frequently done before, but seeing my host in this mood, I deemed it proper to take leave. He did not press me to remain, but as I departed, he shook my hand with even more than usual cordiality. It was about a month after this, and during the interval I had seen nothing of Legrand, when I received a visit at Charleston from his man Jupiter. I had never seen the good old man look so dispirited, and I feared that some disaster had befallen my friend. Well, Duke, said I, what is the matter now? How is your master? Why, to speak the truth, Massa, him not so very well as mort be. Not well? 
I am truly sorry to hear that. What does he complain of? Da, that's it. Im never plain of nothing, but him very sick for all dat. Very sick, Jupiter? Why didn't you say so at once? Is he confined to bed? No, dat he ain't. He ain't find nowhere. Dat's just where the shoe pinch. My mind has got to be very heavy about poor Massa Will. Jupiter, I should like to understand. What is it you are talking about? You say your master is sick. Hasn't he told you what ails him? Why, Massa, taint worth while for to get mad about the matter. Massa will say nothing at all, ain't the matter with him. But then what make him go about looking this way here? We did head down, and he soldiers up, and as white as ghosts. And then he keep a siphon all the time. Keeps a what, Jupiter? Keeps a siphon with the figures on the slate, the queerest figures I ever did see. I see getting to be scared, I tell you. Have for to keep mighty tight eye upon him noovers. Toward the day, he give me slip for the sun up, and he was gone the whole of the blessed day. I had a big stick ready cut for him to give him the good beating when he did come, but I see sick of all that I hadn't the heart at all. He looked so very poorly. Eh? What? Ah, yes. Upon the whole, I think you had better not be too severe with the poor fellow. Don't flog him, Jupiter. He can't very well stand it, but you can form no idea of what has occasioned this illness, or rather this change of conduct. Has anything unpleasant happened since I saw you? No, Massa. There ain't been nothing unpleasant since then. Twas for then I feared. Twas the very day you was there. How? What do you mean? Why, Massa, I mean the bug. There now. The what? The bug. I'm very certain that Massa will bin bit somewhere about the head by that Google bug. And what cause have you, Jupiter, for such supposition? Cause enough, Massa, a mouth too. I never did see sick a dit bug. He kick and he bite everything what come near him. Massa will cotch him fuss, but had for to let him go gin mighty quick, I tell you. Then was the time he must have got to bite. I didn't like the look of the bug mouth myself, no how. So I wouldn't take hold of him with my finger, but I cotch him with a piece of paper that I found. I wrap him up in the paper and stuff piece of it in his mouth. That was the way. And you think then that your master was really bitten by the beetle, and that the bite made him sick? I don't think nothing about it. I know it. To make him dream about de ghoul so much, it taint cause he bit by de ghoul bug. I see heard about dem ghoul bugs for this. But how do you know he dreams about gold? How I know? Cause he talk about it in his sleep. That's how I knows. Well, Jupe, perhaps you are right. But to what fortunate circumstance am I to attribute the honour of a visit from you today? What de matter, Massa? Did you bring any message from Mr. Legrand? No, I bring this here pistol. And here Jupiter handed me a note which ran thus. My dear, why have I not seen you for so long a time? I hope you have not been so foolish as to take offence to any little brusquerie of mine. But no, that is improbable. Since I saw you, I have had great cause for anxiety. I have something to tell you, yet scarcely know how to tell it, or whether I should tell at all. I have not been quite well for some days past, and poor old Duke annoys me, almost beyond endurance, by his well-meant attentions. Would you believe it? He had prepared a huge stick the other day, with which to chastise me for giving him the slip, and spending the day, solace, among the hills of the mainland. I verily believe that my ill looks alone saved me a flogging. I have made no addition to my cabinet since we met. If you can in any way make it convenient, come over with Jupiter. Do come. I wish to see you tonight upon business of importance. I assure you that it is of the highest importance. Ever yours, William Legrand. There was something in the tone of this note which gave me great uneasiness. Its whole style differed materially from what of Legrand. What could he be dreaming of? 
What new crotchet possessed his excitable brain? What business of the highest importance could he possibly have to transact? Jupiter's account of him boded no good. I dreaded lest the continued pressure of misfortune had at length fairly unsettled the reason of my friend. Without a moment's hesitation, therefore, I prepared to accompany the man. Upon reaching the wharf, I noticed a scythe and three spades, all apparently new, lying in the bottom of the boat in which we were to embark. What is the meaning of all this, dupe? I inquired. Him, Sif, Massa, and Spade. Very true, but what are they doing here? Him de Sif, and de Spade, what Massa will sispon my buying it for him in de town, and de Debil's own lot of money. I had to give for him. But what in the name of all that is mysterious is your Massa will going to do with scythes and spades? That's more than I know, and de Bill take me if I don't believe tis more than he to know to. But it's all come ob de bug. Finding that no satisfaction was to be obtained of Jupiter, whose whole intellect seemed to be absorbed by de bug, I now stepped into the boat and made sail. With a fair and strong breeze, we soon ran into the little cove to the northward of Fort Moultrie, and a walk of some two miles brought us to the hut. It was about three in the afternoon when we arrived, Legrand had been awaiting us in eager expectation. He grasped my hand with a nervous expressment, which alarmed me and strengthened the suspicions already entertained. His countenance was pale even to ghastliness, and his deep-set eyes glared with unnatural luster. After some inquiries respecting his health, I asked him, not knowing what better to say, if he had yet obtained the scarabaeus from Lieutenant G. Oh yes, he replied, colouring violently. I got it from him the next morning. Nothing should tempt me to part with that scarabaeus. Do you know that Jupiter is quite right about it? In what way? I asked, with a sad foreboding at heart. In supposing it to be a bug of real gold, he said, this with an air of profound seriousness and I felt inexpressibly shocked. The bug is to make my fortune, he continued with a triumphant smile. To reinstate me and my family possessions, is it any wonder then that I prize it? Since fortune has thought fit to bestow it upon me, I have only to use it properly and I shall arrive at the gold of which it is in the index. Jupiter bring me that scarabaeus. What the bug master? I have rather not go for trouble that bug, you must get him for your own self. Hereupon the grand rose with a grave and stately air and brought me the beetle from a glass case in which it was enclosed. It was a beautiful scarabaeus, and at the time unknown to naturalists. Of course, a great prize in a scientific point of view. There were two round black spots near one extremity of the back, and a long one near the other. The scales were exceedingly hard and glossy, with all the appearance of burnished gold. The weight of the insect was very remarkable, and taking all things into consideration, I could hardly blame Jupiter for his opinion respecting it. What to make of Legrand's agreement with that opinion, I could not for the life of me tell. I sent for you, he said in a grandiloquent tone, when I had completed my examination of the beetle. I sent for you that I might have your counsel and assistance in furthering the views of fate and of the bug. My dear Legrand, I cried, interrupting him, you are certainly unwell, and had better use some little precautions. You shall go to bed and I will remain with you for a few days. Until you get over this, you are feverish and feel my pulse, he said. I felt it and, to say the truth, found not the slightest indication of fever. But you may be ill and yet have no fever. Allow me this once to prescribe for you in the first place. Go to bed in the next. You are mistaken, he interposed. I am as well as I can expect to be under the excitement which I suffer. If you really wish me well, you will relieve this excitement. And how is this to be done? Very easily. Jupiter and myself are going upon an expedition into the hills, upon the mainland, and in this expedition we shall need the aid of some person in whom we can confide. You are the only one we can trust. Whether we succeed or fail, the excitement which you now perceive in me will be equally allayed. I am anxious to oblige you in any way, I replied. 
But do you mean to say that this infernal beetle has any connection with your expedition into the hills? It has. Then, Legrand, I can become a party to no such absurd proceeding. I am sorry, very sorry, for we shall have to try it by ourselves. Try it by ourselves? The man is surely mad. But stay, how long do you propose to be absent? Probably all night. I shall start immediately and be back at all events by sunrise. And you promise me upon your honour that when this freak of yours is over and the bug business, God, settled to your satisfaction, you will then return home and follow my advice implicitly as that of your physician? Yes, I promise. And now let us be off, for we have no time to lose. With a heavy heart, I accompanied my friend. We started about four o'clock, the grand Jupiter, the dog, and myself. Jupiter had with him the scythe and spades, the whole of which he insisted upon carrying, more through fear, it seemed to me, of trusting either of the implements within reach of his master than from any excess of industry or complacence. His demeanor was dogged in the extreme, and that d -d bug were the sole words which escaped his lips during the journey. For my own part, I had charge of a couple of dark lanterns, while Legrand contented himself with the scarabaeus, which he carried attached to the end of a bit of whip cord, twirling it to and fro with the air of a conjurer as he went. When I observed this last plain evidence of my friend's aberration of mind, I could scarcely refrain from tears. I thought it best, however, to humour his fancy, at least for the present, or until I could adopt some more energetic measures with a chance of success. In the meantime, I endeavoured but all in vain to sound him in regard to the object of the expedition. Having succeeded in inducing me to accompany him, he seemed unwilling to hold conversation upon any topic of minor importance, and to all my questions vouchsafed no other reply than, we shall see. We crossed the creek at the head of the island by means of a skiff and, ascending the high grounds on the shore of the mainland, proceeded in a northwesterly direction through a tract of country excessively wild and desolate, where no trace of a human footstep was to be seen. Le Grand led the way with decision, pausing only for an instant here and there to consult what appeared to be certain landmarks of his own contrivance upon a former occasion. In this manner we journeyed for about two hours and the sun was just setting when we entered a region infinitely more dreary than any yet seen. It was a species of table land near the summit of an almost inaccessible hill, densely wooded from base to pinnacle, and interspersed with huge crags that appeared to lie loosely upon the soil, and in many cases were prevented from precipitating themselves into the valleys below, merely by the support of the trees against which they reclined. Deep ravines in various directions gave an air of still sterner solemnity to the scene. The natural platform to which we had clambered was thickly overgrown with brambles, through which we soon discovered that it would have been impossible to force our way but for the scythe, and Jupiter, by direction of his master, proceeded to clear for us a path to the foot of this enormously tall tulip tree, which stood with some eight or ten oaks, upon a level and far surpassed them all and all other trees which I had seen ever seen in the beauty of its foliage and form, in the wild spread of its branches, and in the general majesty of its appearance. When we reached this tree, the Grand turned to Jupiter and asked him if he thought he could climb it. The old man seemed a little staggered by the question, and for some moments made no reply. At length he approached the huge trunk, walked slowly around it, and examined it with minute attention. When he had completed his scrutiny, he merely said, Yes, Massa. Jupe climb any tree he ever see in he life. Then up with you as soon as possible, for it will soon be too dark to see what we are about. How far must I go up, Massa? inquired Jupiter. Get up the main trunk first, and then I will tell you which way to go. And here, stop. Take this beetle with you. De bug, Massa Will? De ghoul bug, cried the man drawing back in dismay. What for must tote de bug wade up de tree? Don't know if I do. If you are afraid, you, a great big man like you, to take hold of a harmless little dead beetle, why you can carry it up by this string. But if you do not take it up with you in some way, I shall be under the necessity of breaking your head with this shovel. What de matter now, massa? said Jupe, evidently shamed into compliance. 
always want for to raise fuss with old man was only fun in anyhow. Me feared de bug, what I care for de bug. Here he took cautiously hold of the extreme end of the string, and maintaining the insect as far from his person as circumstances would permit, prepared to ascend the tree. In youth, the tulip tree, or Liriodendrum tulip etherum, the most magnificent of American foresters, has a trunk peculiarly smooth and often rises to a great height without lateral branches. But in its ripe age, the bark becomes gnarled and uneven. While many short limbs make their appearance on the stem, thus the difficulty of ascension in the present case lay more in semblance than in reality. Embracing the huge cylinder as closely as possible, with his arms and knees seizing with his hands some projections, and resting his naked toes upon others, Jupiter, after one or two narrow escapes from falling, at length wiggled himself into the first great fork, and seemed to consider the whole business as virtually accomplished. The risk of the achievement was in fact now over, although the climber was some sixty or seventy feet from the ground. Which way must go now, Massa Will? he asked. Keep up the largest branch, the one on this side, said Legrand. The man obeyed him promptly, and apparently, with but little trouble, ascended higher and higher until no glimpse of his squat figure could be obtained through the dense foliage which enveloped it. Presently his voice was heard in a sort of halloo. How much further is got to go? How high up are you? asked Legrand. Ever so far, replied the man. Can see the sky through the top of the tree. Never mind the sky, but attend to what I say. Look down the trunk and count the limbs below you on this side. How many limbs have you passed? One, two, three, four, bed. I don't pass five big limb, master, upon this side. Then go one limb higher. In a few minutes the voice was heard again announcing that the seventh limb was attained. Now, Duke, cried Legrand, evidently much excited. I want you to work your way out of that limb as far as you can. If you see anything strange, let me know. By this time, what little doubt I might have entertained of my poor friend's insanity was put finally at rest. I had no alternative but to conclude him stricken with lunacy, and I became seriously anxious about getting him home. While I was pondering upon what best to be done, Jupiter's voice was again heard. Must fear for to venture upon this limb very far. Tis dead limb, but he much older way. Did you say it was a dead limb, Jupiter? cried Legrand in a quavering voice. Yes, master, him dead as a doornail, done up for sight, done departed this here life. What in the name of heaven shall I do? asked Legrand, seemingly in the greatest distress. Do, said I, glad for an opportunity to interpose a word. Why come home and go to bed? Come now, that's a fine fellow, it's getting late, and besides, you remember your promise. Jupiter, cried he, without heeding me in the least, do you hear me? Yes, Massa will hear you ever so plain. Try the word well, then, with your knife, and see if you think it very rotten. Him rotten, Massa, sure enough, replied the man in a few moments. But not so very rotten as might be. Might venture out little way to plunder limb by myself, that's true. By yourself? What, what do you mean? Like, I mean the bug. It is very heavy bug. I suppose I drop him down fast and, and the limb won't break with, with just the weight of one old man. You infernal scoundrel, cried Legrand, apparently much relieved. What do you mean by telling me such nonsense as that? As sure as you let that beetle fall, I'll break your neck. Look here, Jupiter. Do you hear me? Yes, master. Needn't hull that poor man that style. Well now listen, if you will venture out on the limb as far as you think safe, and not let go of the beetle, I'll make you a present of a silver dollar as soon as you get down. I'm going, Nassau Will. D-Days. Replied the man very promptly. Must out to the end now. Out to the end? Here fairly screamed Legrand. Do you say you are out to the end of that limb? Soon to be the end, master. Oh, oh Lord, go now, master. What is this here upon the tree? Well, cried Legrand, highly delighted. What is it? I take nothing but a skull. 
somebody been left in the head of the tree, and the crow's gone to gobble every bit of the meat off. A skull, you say? Very well. How is it fastened to the limb? What holds it on? Sure enough, master, must look. By this very curious circumstance, upon my word, there's a great big nail in the skull that fastens it up under the tree. Well now, Jupiter, do exactly as I tell you. Do you hear? Yes, Master. Pay attention then. Find the left eye of the skull. Hum hum, that's good. Why there ain't no eye left at all? Curse your stupidity. Do you know your right from your left? Yes, I know that. Tis my left hand that I chops the wood with. To be sure, you are left handed, and your left eye is on the same side as your left hand. Now I suppose you can find the left eye of the skull, or the place where the left eye has been, have you found it? There was a long pause. At length, the man answered. Is the left eye of the skull upon the same side as the left hand of the skull too? Because the skull ain't got not a bit of a hand at all. I got, never mind. I got the left eye now. Here the left eye. What must I do with it? Let the beetle drop through it as far as the string will reach. But be careful, and not let go of your hold of the string. Oh, that damn master will. Mighty easy thing for to put the bug through the hole. Now look out for him down below. During this colloquy, no portion of Jupiter's person could be seen. But the beetle, which he had suffered to descend, was now visible at the end of the string and glistened like a globe of burnished gold in the last rays of the setting sun some of which still faintly illumined the eminence upon which we stood. The scarabaeus hung quite clear of any branches and if allowed to fall, would have fallen at our feet. Legrand immediately took the scythe and cleared with it a circular space, three or four yards in diameter, just beneath the insect, and having accomplished this, ordered Jupiter to let go of the string and come down from the tree. Driving a peg with great nicety into the ground at the precise spot where the beetle fell, My friend now produced from his pocket a tape measure, fastening one end of this at the point of the trunk of the tree, which was nearest the peg. He unrolled it till it reached the peg, and thence farther unrolled it in the direction already established by the two points of the tree and the peg, for the distance of fifty feet. Jupiter clearing away the brambles with the scythe, at the spot thus attained a second peg was driven, and about this, as a center, a rude circle about four feet in diameter described. Taking now a spade himself and giving one to Jupiter and one to me, the Grand begged us to set about one to digging as quickly as possible. To speak the truth, I had no especial relish for such amusement at the time, and at that particular moment would most willingly have declined it, for the night was coming on and I felt much fatigued with the exercise already taken, but I saw no mode of escape, and was fearful of disturbing my poor friend's equanimity by refusal. Could I have depended indeed upon Jupiter's aid? I would have had no hesitation in attempting to get the lunatic home by force, but I was too well assured of the old man's disposition to hope that he would assist me under any circumstances in a personal contest with his master. I made no doubt the latter had been infected with some of the innumerable southern superstitions about money buried, and that his fantasy had received confirmation by the finding of the Scarabaeus, or perhaps by Jupiter's obstinacy, in maintaining it to be a bug of real gold. A mind disposed to lunacy would readily be led away by such suggestions, especially if chiming in with favourite preconceived ideas. And then I called to mind the poor fellow's speech about the beetle's being, the index of his fortune. Upon the whole, I was sadly vexed and puzzled, but at length I concluded to make a virtue of necessity, to dig with a good will, and thus the sooner to convince the visionary by ocular demonstration of the fallacy of the opinions he entertained. The lanterns having been lit, we all fell to work with a zeal worthy of a more rational cause, and as the glare fell upon our persons and implements, I could not help thinking how picturesque a group we composed, and how strange and superstitious our labours must have appeared to any interloper who by chance might have stumbled upon our whereabouts. We dug steadily for two hours, little was said, and our chief embarrassment lay in the yelpings of the dog who took exceeding interest in our proceedings. He at length became so obstreperous that we grew fearful of him giving the alarm to some stragglers in the vicinity, or rather this was the apprehension of Legrand. For myself, I should have rejoiced at any interruption which might have enabled me to get the wanderer home. 
the noise was at length very effectually silenced by Jupiter, who, getting out of the hole with a dogged air of deliberation, tied the brute's mouth up with one of his suspenders and then returned with a grave chuckle to his task. When the time mentioned had expired, we had reached the depth of five feet, and yet no signs of any treasure became manifest. A general pause ensued, and I began to hope that the farce was at an end. The Grand, however, although evidently much disconcerted, wiped his brow thoughtfully and recommenced. We had excavated the entire circle of four feet diameter, and now we slightly enlarged the limit and went to the farther depth of two feet. Still nothing appeared. The gold seeker whom I sincerely pitied at length clambered from the pit with the bitterest disappointment imprinted upon every feature and proceeded slowly and reluctantly to put on his coat, which he had thrown off at the beginning of his labor. In the meantime, I made no remark. Jupiter, at a signal from his master, began to gather up his tools. This done, the dog having been unmuzzled, we turned in profound silence towards home. We had taken perhaps a dozen steps in this direction, when with a loud oath, the Grand strode up to Jupiter and seized him by the collar. The astonished man opened his eyes and mouth to the fullest extent, let fall the spades and fell upon his knees. You scoundrel, said Legrand, hissing out the syllables from between his clenched teeth. You infernal black villain! Speak, I tell you. Answer me this instant without prevarication. Which, which is your left eye? Oh my golly, Master Will, ain't this where my left eye for certain? Roared the terrified Jupiter, placing his hand upon his right organ of vision and holding it there with a desperate pertinacity, as if in immediate dread of his master's attempt at a gouge. I thought so, I knew it. Hurrah! vociferated Legrand, letting the man go, and executing a series of curvettes and caracols, much to the astonishment of his valet, who, arising from his knees, looked mutely from his master to myself, and then from myself to his master. Come, we must go back, said the latter. The game's not up yet. And he again led the way to the tulip tree. Jupiter, said he, when he reached the foot, come here. Was the skull nailed to the limb with the face outward or with the face to the limb? The face was out, Massa, so that the crows could get at the eyes good, without any trouble. Well then, was it this eye or that through which you let the beetle fall? Here Legrand touched each of Jupiter's eyes. Twas this eye, Massa. De Lefai, just as you tell me, and here it was his right eye that the man indicated. That will do. We must try it again. Here my friend, about whose madness I now saw, or fancied that I saw, certain indications of method, removed the peg which marked the spot where the beetle fell, to a spot about three inches to the westward of its former position. Taking now the tape measure from the nearest point of the trunk to the peg as before, and continuing the extension in a straight line to the distance of 50 feet, a spot was indicated, removed by several yards from the point at which we had been digging. Around the new position, a circle, somewhat larger than in the former instance, was now described, and we again set to work with the spades. I was dreadfully weary, but scarcely understanding what had occasioned the change in my thoughts, I felt no longer any great aversion from the labor imposed, I had become most unaccountably interested, nay, even excited. Perhaps there was something amid all the extravagant demeanor of Legrand, some air of forethought, or of deliberation which impressed me. I dug eagerly, and now and then caught myself actually looking with something that very much resembled expectation for the fancied treasure, the vision of which had demented my unfortunate companion. At a period when such vagaries of thought most fully possessed me, and when we had been at work perhaps an hour and a half, we were again interrupted by the violent howlings of the dog. His uneasiness in the first instance had been evidently but the result of playfulness or caprice, but he now assumed a bitter and serious tone. Upon Jupiter's again attempting to muzzle him, he made furious resistance and, leaping into the hole, tore up the mould frantically with his claws. In a few seconds he had uncovered a mass of human bones forming two complete skeletons, intermingled with several buttons of metal and what appeared to be the dust of decayed woolen. One or two strokes of a spade upturned the blade of a large Spanish knife, and as we dug farther, three or four loose pieces of gold and silver coin came to light. At the sight of these, the joy of Jupiter could scarcely be restrained, but the countenance of his master wore an air of extreme disappointment. He urged us, however, to continue our exertions, 
and the words were hardly uttered when I stumbled and fell forward, having caught the toe of my boot in a large ring of iron that lay half buried in the loose earth. We now worked in earnest, and never did I pass ten minutes of more intense excitement. During this interval, we had fairly unearthed an oblong chest of wood, which from its perfect preservation and wonderful hardness, had plainly been subjected to some mineralizing process, perhaps that of the bichloride of mercury. This box was three feet and a half long, three feet broad and two and a half feet deep. It was secured firmly by bands of wrought iron, riveted and forming a kind of trellis work over the hole. In each side of the chest near the top were three rings of iron, six in all, by means of which a firm hold could be obtained by six persons. Our utmost united endeavors served only to disturb the coffer very slightly in its bed. We at once saw the impossibility of removing so great a weight. Luckily, the sole fastenings of the lid consisted of two sliding bolts. These we drew back, trembling and panting with anxiety. In an instant, a treasure of incalculable value lay gleaming before us. As the rays of the lanterns fell within the pit, there flashed upwards from a confused heap of gold and of jewels, a glow and a glare that absolutely dazzled our eyes. I shall not pretend to describe the feelings with which I gazed. Amazement was of course predominant. Legrand appeared exhausted with excitement and spoke very few words. Jupiter's countenance wore for some minutes as deadly a pallor as it was possible, in the nature of things for any man's visage to assume. He seemed stupefied, thunder-stricken. Presently he fell upon his knees in the pit and burying his naked arms up to elbows in gold, let them there remain as if enjoying the luxury of a bath. At length with a deep sigh he exclaimed as if in a soliloquy, and dis all come ob de gulbug, de putty gulbug, de poor little gulbug. What I boost in dat savage kind of style, ain't you shamed of yourself, man, unto me dat. It became necessary at last that I should arouse both master and valet to the expediency of removing the treasure. It was growing late and it behooved us to make exertion, that we might get everything housed before daylight. It was difficult to say what should be done, and much time was spent in deliberation. So confused were the ideas of all. We finally lightened the box by removing two-thirds of its contents, when we were enabled with some trouble to raise it from the hole. The articles taken out were deposited among the brambles, and the dog left to guard them, with strict orders from Jupiter neither upon any pretense to stir from the spot nor to open his mouth until our return. When we hurriedly made for home with the chest, reaching the hut in safety, but after excessive toil at one o'clock in the morning, worn out as we were, it was not in human nature to do more just then. We rested until two and had supper starting for the hills immediately afterwards, armed with three stout sacks, which by good luck were upon the premises. A little before four we arrived at the pit, divided the remainder of the booty, as equally as might be, among us and leaving the holes unfilled again set out for the hut, at which for the second time we deposited our gold burthens, just as the first streaks of the dawn gleamed from over the treetops in the east. We were now thoroughly broken down, but the intense excitement of the time denied us repose. After an unquiet slumber of some three or four hours duration, we arose as if by a pre-concert to make examination of our treasure. The chest had been full to the brim, and we spent the whole day and the greater part of the next night in a scrutiny of its contents. There had been nothing like order or arrangement. Everything had been heaped in promiscuously. Having assorted all with care, we found ourselves possessed of even vaster wealth than we had at first supposed. In coin, there was rather more than $450,000. Estimating the value of the pieces as accurately as we could by the tables of the period, there was not a particle of silver. All was gold of antique date and of great variety. French, Spanish, and German money, with a few English guineas and some counters, of which we had never seen specimens before. There were several very large and heavy coins, so worn that we could make nothing of their inscriptions. There was no American money. The value of the jewels we found more difficulty in estimating. There were diamonds, some of them exceedingly large and fine, 110 in all, and not one of them small. 18 rubies of remarkable brilliancy, 310 emeralds, all very beautiful, and 21 sapphires with an opal. These stones had all been broken from their settings and thrown loose in the chest. 
The settings themselves, which we picked out from among other gold, appear to have been beaten up with hammers, as if to prevent identification. Besides all this, there was a vast quantity of solid gold ornaments, nearly 200 massive finger and earrings, rich chains, 30 of these if I remember, 83 very large and heavy crucifixes, five gold censers of great value, a prodigious golden punch bowl, ornamented with richly chased vine leaves, and bacchanalian figures, with two sword handles exquisitely embossed, and many other smaller articles which I cannot recollect. The weight of these valuables exceeded 350 pounds over de poise, and in this estimate I have not included 197 superb gold watches, three of the number being worth each $500. Many of them were very old, and as timekeepers valueless, the works having suffered more or less from corrosion, but all were richly jeweled and in cases of great worth. We estimated the entire content of the chest that night at a million and a half dollars, and upon the subsequent disposal of the trinkets and jewels, a few being retained for own use, it was found that we had greatly undervalued the treasure. When at length we had concluded our examination and the intense excitement of the time had, in some measure, subsided, Legrand, who saw that I was dying with impatience for a solution of this most extraordinary riddle, entered into a full detail of all the circumstances connected with it. You remember, said he, the night when I handed you the rough sketch I had made of the Scarabaeus. You recollect also that I became quite vexed at you for insisting that my drawing resembled a death's head. When you first made this assertion I thought you were jesting, but afterwards I called to mind the peculiar spots on the back of the insect, and admitted to myself that your remark had some little foundation in fact. Still the sneer at my graphic powers irritated me, for I am considered a good artist, and therefore when you handed me the scrap of parchment, I was about to crumple it up and throw it angrily into the fire. The scrap of paper you mean, said I. No. It had much of the appearance of paper, and at first I supposed it to be such, but when I came to draw upon it I discovered it at once to be a piece of very thin parchment. It was quite dirty, you remember. Well, as I was in the very act of crumpling it up, my glance fell upon the sketch at which you had been looking, and you may imagine my astonishment when I perceived, in fact, the figure of Death's head just where it seemed to me I have made the drawing of the beetle. For the moment, I was too much amazed to think with accuracy. I knew that my design was very different in detail from this, although there was a certain similarity in general outline. Presently, I took a candle and, seating myself at the other end of the room, proceeded to scrutinize the parchment more closely. Upon turning it over, I saw my own sketch upon the reverse just as I made it. My first idea now was mere surprise at the really remarkable similarity of outline, at the singular coincidence involved in the fact that, unknown to me, there should have been a skull upon the other side of the parchment, immediately beneath my figure of the scarabaeus, and that this skull, not only in outline but in size, should so closely resemble my drawing. I say the singularity of this coincidence absolutely stupefied me for a time. This is the usual effect of such coincidences. The mind struggles to establish a connection, a sequence of cause and effect, and being unable to do so, suffers a species of temporary paralysis. But when I recovered from this stupor, there dawned upon me gradually a conviction which startled even me far more than the coincidence. I began distinctly, positively, to remember that there had been no drawing on the parchment when I made my sketch of the Scarabaeus. I became perfectly certain of this, for I recollected turning up first one side and then the other in search of the cleanest spot. Had the skull been there, of course I could not have failed to notice it. Here was indeed a mystery which I felt impossible to explain, but even at that early moment, there it seemed to glimmer faintly within the most remote and secret chambers of my intellect, a glowworm-like conception that of truth which last night's adventure brought to so magnificent a demonstration. I arose at once, and putting the parchment away securely, dismissed all farther reflection until I should be alone. When you had gone, and when Jupiter was fast asleep, I betook myself to a more methodical investigation of the affair. In the first place, I considered the manner in which the parchment had come to my possession. The spot where we discovered the Scarabaeus was on the coast of the mainland, about a mile eastward of the island, and but a short distance above high water mark. Upon my taking hold of it, it gave me a sharp bite which caused me to let it drop. 
Jupiter, with his accustomed caution before seizing the insect, which had flown towards him, looked about him for a leaf or something of the nature by which to take hold of it. It was at this moment that his eyes and mine also fell upon the scrap of parchment, which I then supposed to be paper. It was lying half buried in the sand, a corner sticking up, near the spot where we found it. I observed the remnants of the hull, of what appeared to have been the ship's long boat. The wreck seemed to have been there for a very great while, for the resemblance to boat timbers could scarcely be traced. Well, Jupiter picked up the parchment, wrapped the beetle in it and gave it to me. Soon afterwards we turned to go home, and on the way met Lieutenant G. I showed him the insect and he begged me to let him take it to the fort. On my consenting, he thrust it forthwith into his waistcoat pocket without the parchment, in which it had been wrapped, and which I had continued to hold in my hand during his inspection. Perhaps he dreaded my changing my mind, and thought it best to make sure the prize at once. You know how enthusiastic he is in all subjects connected with natural history. At the same time, without being conscious of it, I must have deposited the parchment in my own pocket. You remember that when I went to the table for the purpose of making a sketch of the beetle, I found no paper where it was usually kept. I looked in the drawer and found none there. I searched my pockets, hoping to find an old letter, and then my hand fell upon the parchment. I thus detail the precise mode in which it came to my possession, for the circumstances impressed me with peculiar force. No doubt you will think me fanciful, but I've already established a kind of connection. I had put together two links of a great chain. There was a boat lying on a sea coast, and not far from the boat was a parchment, not a paper with a skull depicted on it. You will of course ask, where is the connection? I reply that the skull or death's head is the well-known emblem of the pirate. The flag of the death's head is hoisted in all engagement. I have said that the scrap was parchment and not paper. Parchment is durable, almost imperishable. Matters of little moment are rarely consigned to parchment since for the mere ordinary purposes of drawing or writing, it's not so nearly well adapted as paper. This reflection suggested some meaning, some relevancy in the death's head. I did not fail to observe also the form of the parchment, although it is one of its corners had been by some accident destroyed. It could have been seen that the original form was oblong. It was just such a slip indeed as might have been chosen for a memorandum, for a record of something to be long remembered and carefully preserved. But, I interposed, you say that the skull was not upon the parchment when you made the drawing of the beetle. How then do you trace any connection between the boat and the skull, since this latter, according to your own admission, must have been designed, God only knows how or by whom, at some period subsequent to your sketching the Scarabaeus? Ah, hereupon turns the whole mystery, although the secret at this point I had comparatively little difficulty in solving. My steps were sure, and could afford but a single result. I reasoned, for example, thus. When I drew the scarabaeus, there was no skull apparent on the parchment. When I had completed the drawing, I gave it to you, and observed you narrowly until you returned it. You, therefore, did not design the skull, and no one else was present to do it. That it was not done by human agency, and nevertheless, it was done. At this stage my reflections I endeavoured to remember, and did remember with entire distinctness, every incident which occurred about the period in question. The weather was chilly, and a fire was blazing on the hearth. I was heated with exercise and sat near the table. You, however, had drawn a chair close to the chimney, just as I placed the parchment in your hand, and as you were in the act of inspecting it, Wolf, the Newfoundland, entered and leaped upon your shoulders. With your left hand you caressed him and kept him off while your right holding the parchment was permitted to fall listlessly between your knees and in close proximity to the fire. At one moment I thought the blazer caught it and was about to caution you, but before I could speak you had withdrawn it and were engaged in its examination. When I considered all these particulars I doubted not for a moment that heat had been the agent in bringing to light on the parchment the skull which I saw designed on it. You are well aware that chemical preparations exist, and have existed time out of mind, by means of which it is possible to write on either paper or vellum, so that the characters can become invisible. Only when subjected to the action of fire, Zaffa suggested in Aqua Regia, and diluted with four times its weight of water, it sometimes employed a green-tinted result. The regulus of cobalt, dissolved in spirit of nitre, gives a red, these colours disappear at longer or shorter intervals after the material written on cools, but again become apparent upon the reapplication of heat. 
I now scrutinise the death's head with care. Its outer edges, the edges of the drawing nearest the edge of the vellum, were far more distinct than the others. It was clear that the action of the caloric had been imperfect or unequal. I immediately kindled a fire and subjected every portion of the parchment to a glowing heat. At first, the only effect was the strengthening of the faint lines in the skull. But, on persevering in the experiment, there became visible at the corner of the slip, diagonally opposite to the spot in which the death's head was delineated, the figure of what I at first supposed to be a goat. A closer scrutiny, however, satisfied me that it was intended for a kid. Ha ha, said I, to be sure I have no right to laugh at you, a million and a half of money is too serious a matter for mirth. But you are not about to establish a third link in your chain. You will not find any especial connection between your pirates and goat. Pirates, you know, have nothing to do with goats. They appertain to the farming interest. But I have just said that the figure was not that of a goat. Well, a kid then. Pretty much the same thing. Pretty much, but not altogether. You may have heard of one Captain Kid. I had once looked on the figure of the animal as a kind of punning or hieroglyphical signature. I say signature because its position on the vellum suggested this idea. The death's head at the corner diagonally opposite had in the same manner the air of a stamp or seal. But I was sorely put out by the absence of all else, of the body of my imagined instrument, of the text for my context. I presume you expected to find a letter between the stamp and the signature? Something of that kind. The fact is I felt irresistibly impressed with the presentiment of some vast good fortune impending. I can scarcely say why. Perhaps after all, it was rather a desire than actual belief. But do you know that Jupiter's silly words about the bug being of solid gold had a remarkable effect on my fancy? And then these series of accidents and coincidences, these were so very extraordinary. Do you observe how mere an accident it was that these events should have occurred on the sole day of all the year in which it has been or may be sufficiently cool for fire, and that without the fire, or without the intervention of the dog at the precise moment in which he appeared, I should never have become aware of the death's head, and so never the possessor of the treasure? But proceed, I am all impatience. Well, you have heard, of course, the many stories current, the thousand vague rumours afloat about money buried somewhere on the Atlantic coast by Kidd and his associates. These rumours must have had some foundation in fact, and that the rumours have existed so long and so continuously could have resulted, it appeared to me, only from the circumstance of the buried treasure still remaining entombed. Had Kidd concealed his plunder for a time and afterwards reclaimed it, the rumours would scarcely have reached us in their present unvarying form. You will observe that the stories told are all about money seekers, not about money finders. Had the pirate recovered his money, there the affair would have dropped. It seemed to me that some accident, say the loss of a memorandum indicating its locality, had deprived him of the means of recovering it, and that this accident had become known to his followers, who otherwise might never have heard that treasure had been concealed at all and who, busying themselves in vain because unguided attempts to regain it had given first birth and then universal currency to the reports which are now so common. Have you ever heard of an important treasure being unearthed along the coast? Never. But that kid's accumulations were immense is well known. I took it for granted, therefore, that the earth still held them, and you will scarcely be surprised when I tell you that, I felt a hope, nearly amounting to certainty, that the parchment so strangely found involved a lost record of the place of deposit. But how did you proceed? I held the vellum again to the fire, after increasing the heat, but nothing appeared. I now thought it impossible that the coating of dirt might have something to do with the failure, so I carefully rinsed the parchment, pouring warm water over it, and having done this, I placed it in a tin pan, with the skull downwards, and put the pan upon a furnace of lighted charcoal, in a few minutes, the pan having become thoroughly heated, I removed the slip, and to my inexpressible joy, found it spotted in several places with what appeared to be figures arranged in lines. Again, I placed it in the pan, and suffered it to remain another minute. On taking it off, the hole was just as you see it now. Here, Legrand, having reheated the parchment, submitted it my inspection. 
the following characters were rudely traced in a red tint between Death's head and the goat. But, said I, returning him the slip, I am as much in the dark as ever. Were all the jewels of Golconda awaiting me on my solution of this enigma? I am quite sure that I should be unable to earn them. And yet, said Legrand, the solution is by no means so difficult as you might be led to imagine from the first hasty inspection of the characters. These characters, as anyone might readily guess, form a cipher. That is to say, they convey a meaning. But then, from what is known a kid, I could not suppose him capable of constructing any of the more abstruse cryptographs. I made up my mind at once that this was one of a simple species, such, however, as would appear to the crude intellect of the sailor, absolutely insolvable without the key. And you really solved it? Readily. I have solved others of the abstruseness 10,000 times greater. Circumstances and a certain bias of mind have led me to take interest in such riddles. And it may well be doubted whether human ingenuity can construct an enigma of the kind which human ingenuity may not, by proper application, resolve. In fact, having once established connected and legible characters, I scarcely give a thought to the mere difficulty of developing their import. In the present case, indeed in all cases of secret writing, the first question regards the language of the cipher, for the principles of solution so far especially as the more simple ciphers are concerned depend on and are varied by the genius of the particular idiom. In general, there is no alternative but experiment of every tongue known to him who attempts the solution until the true one be obtained. But with the new cipher before us, all difficulty is removed by the signature. The pun on the word kid is appreciable in no other language than the English. But for this consideration, I should have begun my attempts with the Spanish and French, as the tongues in which a secret of this kind would most naturally have been written by a pirate of the Spanish main. As it was, I assumed the cryptograph to be English. You observe there are no divisions between the words. Had there been divisions, the task would have been comparatively easy. In such case, I should have connected with a collation and analysis of the shorter words, and had a word for a single letter occurred, as is most likely, I should have considered the solution as assured. But there being no division, my first step was to ascertain the predominant letters as well as the least frequent. Counting all, I constructed the table thus. Now in English, the letter which most frequently occurs is E. Afterwards, the succession runs thus. A, O, I, D, H, N, R, S, T, U, Y, C, F, G, L, M, W, B, K, P, Q, X, Z. E, however, predominates so remarkably that an individual sentence of any length is rarely seen in which it is not the prevailing character. Here then we have, in the very beginning, the groundwork for something more than a mere guess. The general use which may be made of the table is obvious, but in this particular cipher, we shall only very partially require its aid, as our predominant character is eight. We will commence by assuming it as the E of the natural alphabet. To verify the supposition, let us observe if the eight be seen often in couples, for E is doubled with great frequency in English. In such words, for example, as meet, fleet, speed, seen, been, agree. In the present instance, we see it doubled less than five times, although the cryptograph is brief. Let us assume eight then as E. Now of all the words in the language, the is the most usual. Let us see, therefore, whether they are not repetitions of any three characters in the same order of collocation, the last of them being eight. If we discover repetitions of such letters so arranged, they will most probably represent the word the. On inspection, we find no less than seven such arrangements, the characters being semicolon for eight. We may therefore assume that the semicolon represents T, four represents H, and eight represents E the last being now well confirmed. Thus, a great step had been taken. But having established a single word, we are enabled to establish a vastly important point. That is to say, several commencements and terminations of other words. Let us refer, for example, to the last instance but one, in which the combination semicolon for eight occurs, not far from the end of the cipher. We know that the semicolon immediately ensuing is the commencement of a word, and of the six characters succeeding this, T-H-E, we are cognizant of no less than five. 
Let us see these characters down, thus by the letters we know them to represent, leaving a space for the unknown. T, ETH. Here we are enabled at once to discard the TH as forming no portion of the word commencing with the first T, since by experiment of the entire alphabet for a letter adapted to the vacancy we perceive, that no word can be formed of which this TH can be a part. We are thus narrowed into TEE. -E. And going through the alphabet, if necessary as before, we arrive at the word tree. As the sole possible reading, we thus gain another letter, R, represented by bracket, with the words the tree in juxtaposition. Looking beyond these words for a short distance, we again see the combination semicolon for eight, and employ it by the way of termination to what immediately proceeds. We have thus this arrangement, the tree semicolon for bracket, question mark three, four, the, or substituting the natural letters where known, it reads thus, the tree, THR, question mark three H, the. Now if in place of the unknown character, we leave blank spaces or substitute dots, we read thus, the tree, th H, T, H, E. When the word through makes itself evident at once, but this discovery gives us three new letters, O, U, and G represented by dagger question mark and three. Looking now narrowly through the cipher for combinations of known characters, we find not very far from the beginning this arrangement, 83 bracket 88 or egri, which plainly is the conclusion of the word degree and gives us another letter D represented by dagger. Four letters upon the word degree, we perceive the combination semicolon four six bracket semicolon 88 star. Translating the known character and thusly representing are the unknown dots as before we read thus, th dot rt. An arrangement immediately suggested of the word 13 and again furnishing us with two new characters, i and n represented by six and star. Referring now to the beginning of the cryptograph, we find the combination five three double dagger, double dagger, dagger. Translating as before, we obtain dot good, which assures us that the first letter is a and that the first two words are a good. To avoid confusion, it is now time we arrange our key as far as discovered in a tabular form. We have therefore no less than 10 of the most important letters represented, and it will be unnecessary to proceed with the details of the solution. I have said enough to convince you that ciphers of this nature are readily soluble, and to give you some insight into the rationale of their development. But be assured that the specimen before us appertains to the very simplest species of cryptograph. It now only remains to give you the full translation of the characters upon the parchment as unriddled. Here it is. A good glass in the bishop's hostel in the devil's seat, 41 degrees and 13 minutes northeast, and by north main branch, seventh limb east side shoot from the left eye of the death's head a beeline from the tree through the shot 50 feet out. But, said I, the enigma seems still as a bad a condition as ever. How is it possible to extort a meaning from all this jargon about devil's seats, death's heads, and bishop's hostel? I confess, replied the Grand, that the matter still wears a serious aspect when regarded with a casual glance. My first endeavor was to divide the sentence into the natural division intended by the cryptographist. You mean to punctuate it? Something of that kind. But how is that possible to affect this? I reflected that it had been a point with the writer to run his words together without division, so as to increase the difficulty of solution. Now a not over acute man in pursuing such an object would be nearly certain to overdo the matter when in the course of his composition, he arrived at the break in his subject, which would naturally require a pause or a point. He would be exceedingly apt to run his characters at this place more than usually close together. If you will observe the MS, in the present instance, you will easily detect five such cases of unusual crowding. Acting on this hint, I made the division thus. A good glass in the bishop's hostel in the devil's seat. 41 degrees and 13 minutes. Northeast and by north. Main branch, seventh limb, east side. Shoot from the left eye of the death's head. A beeline from the tree through the shot, 50 feet out. Even this division, said I, leaves me in the dark. It left me also in the dark, replied the Grand, for a few days, during which I made diligent inquiry in the neighborhood of Sullivan's Island for any building that went by the name of the Bishop's Hotel, for of course I dropped the obsolete word hostel, gaining no information on the subject, 
I was on the point of extending my sphere of search and proceeding in a more systematic manner, when one morning it entered into my head quite suddenly that this bishop's hostel might have been a reference to an old family of the name Bessop, which, time out of mind, had held possession of an ancient manor house about four miles to the northward of the island. I accordingly went over to the plantation and reinstituted my inquiries among the old men of the place. At length, one of the most aged of the women said she had heard of such a place at Bessop's castle and thought that she could guide me to it, but that it was not a castle nor a tavern but a high rock. I offered to pay her well for her trouble, and after some demur she consented to accompany me to the spot. We found it without much difficulty. When dismissing her, I proceeded to examine the place. The castle consisted of an irregular assemblage of cliffs and rocks, one of the latter being quite remarkable for its height as well as for its insulated and artificial appearance. I clambered to its apex, and then felt much at loss as to what should be next done. While I was busied in reflection, my eyes fell upon a narrow ledge in the eastern face of the rock, perhaps a yard below the summit on which I stood. This ledge projected about 18 inches, and was not more than a foot wide, while a niche in the cliff just above it gave it a rude semblance to one of the hollow-backed chairs used by our ancestors. I made no doubt that here was the devil's seat, alluded to in the MS, and now I seemed to grasp the full secret of the riddle. The good glass, I knew, could have been referenced to nothing but a telescope, for the word glass is rarely employed in any other sense by seamen. Now here, I at once saw was a telescope to be used, and a definite point of view admitting no variation from which to use it, nor did I hesitate to believe that the phrases 41 degrees and 13 minutes, and northeast by north, were intended as directions for the levelling of the glass. Greatly excited by these discoveries, I hurried home, procured a telescope, and returned to the rock. I let myself down to the ledge, and found that it was impossible to retain a seat on it unless in one particular position. This fact confirmed my preconceived idea. I proceeded to use the glass. Of course, the 41 degrees and 13 minutes could allude to nothing but elevation above the visible horizon, since the horizontal direction was clearly indicated by the words northeast and by north. This latter direction I at once established by means of a pocket compass, then by pointing the glass at nearly an angle of 41 degrees of elevation as I could do by guess. I moved it cautiously up or down until my attention was arrested by a circular rift, or an opening in the foliage of a large tree that overtopped its fellows in the distance. In the centre of this rift I perceived a white spot, but could not at first distinguish what it was. Adjusting the focus on the telescope I again looked and now made it out to be a human skull. On this discovery I was so sanguine as to consider the enigma solved, for the phrase main branch, seventh limb, east side could refer only to the position of the skull on the tree, while shoot from the left eye of the death's head admitted also of but one interpretation. In regard to a search for a buried treasure, I perceived that the design was to drop a bullet from the left eye of the skull and that a beeline, or in other words a straight line drawn from the nearest point of the trunk through the shot, and thence extended to a distance of 50 feet, would indicate a definite point, and beneath this point, I thought it at least possible that a deposit of value lay concealed. All this, said I, is exceedingly clear, and although ingenious, still simple and explicit, when you left the bishop's hotel, what then? Why, having carefully taken the bearings of the tree, I turned homewards. The instant that I left the devil's seat, however, the circular rift vanished, nor could I get a glimpse of it afterwards, turn as I would. What seems to me the chief ingenuity in this whole business is the fact, for repeated experiment has convinced me that it is a fact, that the circular opening in question is visible from no other attainable point of view than that afforded by the narrow ledge on the face of the rock. In this expedition to the bishop's hotel, I had been attended by Jupiter who had no doubt observed for some weeks past the abstraction of my demeanour, and took especial care not to leave me alone. But on the next day, getting up very early, I contrived to give him the slip, and went into the hills in search of the tree. After much toil, I found it. When I came home at night, my valet proposed to give me a flogging. With the rest of the adventure, I believed you are as well acquainted as myself. I suppose, said I, you missed the spot in the first attempt at digging through Jupiter's stupidity and letting the bug fall through the right instead of the left of the skull. Precisely. This mistake made a difference of about two inches and half a shot. That is to say, in the position of the peg nearest the tree, and had the treasure been beneath the shot, the error would have been of little moment. But the shot together with the nearest point of the tree were merely two points for the establishment of a line of direction. 
and of course the error, however trivial in the beginning, increased as we proceeded with the line, and by the time we had gone 50 feet, threw us off the scent. But for my deep-seated convictions the treasure was here somewhere actually buried, we might have had all our labour in vain. I presume the fancy of the skull of letting fall a bullet through the skull's eye was suggested to Kid by the piratical flag. No doubt he felt a kind of poetical consistency in recovering his money through this ominous insignium. Perhaps so. Still, I cannot help thinking that common sense had quite as much to do with the matter as poetical consistency. To be visible from the devil's seat, it was necessary that the object, if small, should be white and there is nothing like your human skull for retaining and even increasing its whiteness under exposure to all vicissitudes of weather. But your grand eloquence and your conduct in swinging the beetle, how excessively odd. I was sure you were mad. And why did you insist on letting fall the bug instead of a bullet from the skull? Why, to be frank, I felt somewhat annoyed by your evident suspicions touching my sanity, and so resolved to punish you quietly in my own way, by a little bit of sober mystification. For this reason I swung the beetle, and for this reason I let it fall from the tree. An observation of yours about its great weight suggested the latter idea. Yes, I perceive, and now there is only one point which puzzles me. What are we to make of the skeletons found in the hole? That is a question I am no more able to answer than yourself. There seems, however, only one plausible way of accounting for them, and yet it is dreadful to believe in such atrocity as my suggestion would imply. It is clear that Kid, if Kid indeed secreted this treasure, which I doubt not, it is clear that he must have had assistance in the labour. But the worst of this labour concluded, he may have thought it expedient to remove all participants in his secret. Perhaps a couple of blows with a mattock were sufficient, while his coadjutors were busy in the pit, perhaps it required a dozen. Who shall tell?